candidates running for the Community Preservation Act Commission, I have asked them to come and introduce themselves and say why they are running for it. I think it's very valuable when you're running for a position that you are asked to be at these forums so our residents in the city of Northampton know who is running and why. <coughs> so I am giving up a good portion of my speech because I felt of the importance of these four candidates to be here this evening. I want to go ahead and have Jim Durfer go ahead and present himself, and then he needs to get to the CPC meeting, so Jim, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Ward 6. It's great to see so many uh, friendly faces out there, uh, as well as fellow soccer coaches. Um, a, a brief uh, background on myself. I'm a Florence resident, married to a beautiful Northampton girl for uh, 24 years, uh, and two beautiful children. My educational background includes both a BA from UMass, where I met my pride, and an uh, MBA from Boston College with a uh, specialization in finance. Uh, my professional background includes um, the U.S. Navy as a naval flight officer, and uh, um, I am a combat decorated veteran of the Persian Gulf War. Following the Navy, I worked primarily as a business consultant. Zero seconds. Oh, um, and I am currently uh, retired due to my uh, battle with ALS. I appreciate your support. Thank you. A minute goes by real fast. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mary Gottdiener. I live in Ward 2. I'm just going to jump right into my position on the uh, Community Preservation Act. I, I believe in the Community Preservation Act and what it's done and still can do for Northampton. And I say, let's try to make it work for more people. It's not perfect and it can be improved and I'll work to do that. And for starters, I suggest and I've already suggested to the chair that every other meeting of the CPC be in Florence to <coughs> encourage more participation from people in wards 5, 6, and 7. Uh, the state CPA trust fund, where the match money comes from, belongs to us. If we don't keep the CPA, we won't have access to that money that the North Re uh, Northampton residents have paid into. It will simply be divided among the communities that do have the CPA. There's less and less money available for, uh, now to maintain our city. I think we all know about the economy. We need money to restore our historical buildings that are in need of expensive repairs, to buy farmland, to keep it in agriculture, and to create more affordable housing so that people of all income levels can continue to live here. And the CPA can help us do that. It can't do it on its own. But I'd like to hear from all of you uh, what kind of projects you would like. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Marlene Warren. First of all, I'd like to thank Councilor Lavarge for putting this together. Um, I approached some other wards and they really weren't interested, but uh, thank you, Councilor Lavarge. Um, my name is Marlene Warren. I live on Florence Road here in Ward 6. I work in downtown Northampton. I'm an attorney. I've had my own practice there since 1995. Uh, when I decided to become a candidate for this position, I started to ask people what they thought. Um, I heard about uh, the petition to repeal the act. I, I wanted to hear from those people. I think a lot of the problem is that people don't understand the CPA. Um, the important thing is to vote, even if you vote to repeal uh, the CPA Act in this town, do vote for two of us because it's built into the, to the act itself, to the statute, that two people from the community will represent your interests. The rest of the people on the committee are appointed uh, by, the, by the city council, by uh, the 
mayor, by different commissions. So I'd ask that you be sure and vote for two of us. And we will work, this is my, um, my co-candidate stated, we will work to try to bridge that gap and keep everyone happy if, uh, the, staff, if the CPA is not repealed in this community. So thank you for your time. I'm Dave Rostein. Thank you, Councilor Labarge, and everyone for showing interest in the community. It's one uh, that I care very much about, which is why I'm running for the CPC, which I find to be an incredibly important uh, tool in not only preserving, but bolstering some of the key features that make Northampton and our community uh, so desirable and also strive to make it livable for everybody. But in order to do that, the CPC really needs to be focused and it needs to be well managed. And to me, that means spending sensibly, funding projects fairly, and approaching things in a balanced way. But I bring to the table, I'm also a lawyer. Um, I've worked uh, in environmental law for the past 15 years as a wildlife biologist before that. Um, in conservation, historic preservation, and uh, affordable housing and mainstay of my work. Uh, but as a lawyer, I think we all bring to the table an ability to tease out some of the critical facts make reasoned decisions that are defensible. So I'd love to be your advocate and I uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. I want to thank all four of you for attending this forum this evening. And um, you're welcome to stay and watch the rest of the forum. And Jim, you can go to see the thing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This evening. Patty Healy, who will be the moderator for the Counselors at Large. Um, this is her first time doing a candidate's forum, and I want to e introduce also Michael Holroyd, who also is the moderator for the Mayor's Candidate Race. So if you both would like to come up, you're welcome to come up here and you can explain what you're going to do. I'm going to ask all the candidates for counselors at large to come up to the table, please.
those questions will be asked at the end of those who come up and speak at the microphone. So if you, I, will, I have them with me. If you'd like to take your question back and speak at the microphone first, um, you can do that. Um, each audience member who comes to the microphone is to state the name and address, his name and address, and pose a question to the group. It's a generic question, not directed to an individual, but to all of our counselors. They each have an opportunity to answer the question, starting with Jesse Adams, followed by Mayor John, Adams Cullen, uh, Bill Dwight, and then Michael Janik. And the second question will start with uh, MJ and move in that order, just so you know. Each candidate has a one minute rebuttal um, of their choice um, after each question, after the, the other three candidates have answered the question. Um, I ask that all residents be polite and respectful, as is the spirit of Northampton. Avoid making personal statements and comments. The moderator reserves the right to remind the speaker to avoid debate and to ask their question, the, the intended question. If we use our time wisely, we can cover a lot of ground. And candidates will begin with their opening introduction, which is a statement of one minute, as you know. Um, I told you you'll rotate the alphabetical order. Um, you may speak up to two minutes. Should you wish to respond and rebut, we will give you the opportunity to do so. Uh, we have our timer here. We will have signs. I think you've had that in your last degree as, as well. This, this is a uh, moving breath, you know. 30 seconds. That means stop. Right. It's a great demonstration. Um, at 722, each candidate will be encouraged to make a closing statement for up to two minutes. So the moderator will now recognize the first person who'd like to come to the mic, who would like to come up and ask a question. May we do a Oh! <laughs> 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 we will stop. <laughs> yes, I'm Jesse Adams. My name is Jesse Adams. I'm the incumbent in this race. I've held public office for four years as a Forbes Library trustee. Two years ago, you elected me as your at-large city councilman. And when I was running, I made certain promises to you. And I delivered on these promises by supporting the arts and culture with fresh ideas like Jazz Fest, working towards better government through transparency and reform, carefully scrutinizing our budget to ensure that our spending matches our values and priorities, fighting to maintain public quality, quality public education, advocating for the environment, sustainable living, and public health, listening to all points of view and encouraging spirited and respectful debates. And I love doing these things as your advocate. I deliver, I am proven. For all these reasons, I'd like to continue serving you in a job that I love as your at-large city councilman. My name is MJ Adams Pullen. Some of you might know me by MJ Adams. Other people might know me by Mary John Pullen. Other people might know me by Mary John Adams. Uh, I grew up in uh, Northampton. I'm a product of this very fine school. I actually attended the school the day it opened. Um, but I uh, stand before you as one of two uh, people who you might cast a vote for on November 8th as you elect two city councilors at large. And I ask that you give me due consideration. Um, I think that the things, the issues that are at hand here in this new, um, in this new administration that we're going to have, we're going to have a new mayor come uh, January. We're going to have a newly elected mayor, and we have many issues on the plate in front of us. And I'll share with you that I bring with me uh, to the table a wealth of understanding of the background of what Northampton has been, but also great great ideas about what Northampton can be. Uh, I look forward to really serving to, as a, a, a respectful city councilor who can listen to the people of Northampton, include your information as we make our important decisions moving forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bill Dwight. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Marianne LaBarge and I'd like to thank all the sponsoring agencies for this opportunity to speak to you. I served as city councilor for eight years in the city of Northampton. Uh, I won every, every contested race I had, and after eight years, I thought I had my fill of uh, city government, and, and uh, maybe, maybe some people had their fill with me, I don't know. But the fact is that once I left city government, I found out it did not leave me. I went into uh, radio, local radio, talking about local issues, all the same issues that I was embroiled in while I was serving as a council. 
I'm now actually referring to what MJ just talked about, was that there is, Northampton's in transition. It's also a, at the precipice of, a, of, of, of some challenging times due to the global economic situation. I want to bring my dedication, devotion to serving, once again, the people of the city of Northampton because it, I found out while I was a counselor it was the thing that meant the most to me. Hi, my name is Michael Janik, and I run for City Council at Large. I'd like to thank the Ward 6 Association, Water Not Waste, and Ward 6 Council Marion Barge for putting on this debate and allowing me to be part of it. I believe just like opera singer Jenny Lynn proclaimed in 1851, Northampton is the paradise of America. I'm not a politician, but like you, a proud citizen who, was, who went elected to bring a common sense approach to solving our city's problem. Given the current tough economic times and the decrease in state and federal monies, Northampton will need to have a long-term attitude about priorities instead of a short-term list for economic responsibilities. I believe that the city must do things differently, financially, and not be afraid to look for answers within itself. I've been an active candidate who hasn't been afraid to challenge the current governance of the city, but has shown that I will willing to work for residents and taxpayers in Northampton. I believe that the transparency the residents are looking for can, can no longer be kept behind doors. Our city is a diverse one, and with diversity comes many points of views, who, if allowed, can always strengthen the democratic process. Thank you. So we can begin questions. Would uh, come, please come up to the mic. State your name and address. You don't have to touch the mic. It's it's. Uh, oh, I don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> you observe me. You're not touching the mic. <laughs> My name is Peter Jones. I live at 105 Briarwood Drive, and I think we're very fortunate in Northampton to have so many qualified candidates willing to serve in our public offices. No matter who wins, the city can't lose. My question is this. There's going to be a charter revision shortly, and one of the uh, items on it will be who is going to run the city council meetings. I would like to hear the opinion of each of you concerning whether it ought to be either the whether it ought to be the mayor or the council president who runs city council meetings and why. Good question. We have a chart that was written in the late 19th century. It's very antiquated. I was the vice chair of the Charter Review Committee. And beginning back two years ago, when I was running for Councilor at Large the first time, I spoke of the need for a greater separation of powers within our government. A greater separation of powers would lead to greater um, balance in government, more fairness, and more transparency. Again, I was the vice chair of that committee, and one of our recommendations was to not have the mayor chair of the city council any longer. We are one of two cities in the Commonwealth that has that form of government. It's antiquated, and I support having the council president chair the city council because, again, that, that allows for a better balance of power. Um, throughout the years, we've seen a trend where the executive branch has gained a tremendous amount of power, and I think that we need a better balance. And the reason why is because that will lead to a, a more fair, democratic, balanced government. Thank you, Jesse. Um, you know, Mr. Jones, I actually don't have an opinion on that yet. I must be honest that I work in a nonprofit environment and I work with the board of directors and I'm the executive director. And I think there's a very interesting balance between my board president running the meeting and my opportunity to be there at the meeting and be the manager of the day-to-day -day operations. And so I, I actually don't have a, a good answer for you at the moment, but that's one of the things that I think that the Charter Committee is examining and taking a look at what the balance, what the proper balance of power is. So I guess my answer is, I don't know yet, um, but I would hope to learn on the job, and I think that that's something that we would work through. And I do know that there's some value in having, in a municipal setting, a very clear spokesperson for the city, because I know as I travel around the community, around the region, and people say, you are so lucky to be from the city of Northampton, and you're so lucky to have the mayor that you had, that Claire, has been a very clear and outspoken uh, leader in the community. Uh, so 
I guess my answer is I don't know yet, but I will learn very quickly what that might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Peter, thank you. Actually, great question. Thank you for the compliment, in fact, actually, that, that you opened with. Um, when I served in the council before, there, there was a, there's an associated set of problems on, with any configuration, as you can imagine. The one thing, one of the advantages of having the mayor presiding is the mayor is the only non-voting member, and as such, theoretically, doesn't necessarily have this, it cannot actually lobby for a point and has to preside over and manage the, the tenor of the debate and theoretically loosely following Robert's Rules of Orders and Northampton's own unique version of that. <laughs> but at the same time, there's something to be said to have, uh, have the council president preside. Of course, that confers more power on the council president and, and, and I think as the Charter Committee reviews it and deliberates it, they have to figure out what that means, what the possible outcomes of that would be. Um, I think it frees up for the Council, gives them the opportunity to have more say in, in by and large, but also it confers upon them greater responsibility, which I think cannot be a bad thing, it can only be a good thing. We do have a strong mayor with Council construct, which is, is actually common in the state and as such though within those restrictions and those parameters I think we really could benefit from that as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question again and uh, this is something that all the citizens are looking at is uh, how are we going to uh, move forward in the, uh, the future here with our council and mayor. I believe that the council president should be the one that runs the meeting. Um, and looking at the way the federal government is set up, uh, I think it's a check and balance. Um, with the mayor being such a strong uh, person uh, and sitting in the seat, I think the council president and the council uh, having the power the, where the buck stops, I think can only help uh, for us to have a council president run the meeting. Uh, having said that, um, it is pretty much up to the charter and the input from the citizens and what, what they would like to see. And I would really like to see the citizens put forth their um, the ideas on this. Thank you. Thank you. Would any of you like to respond again? Uh, no, I'm concerned yeah. about the amount of questions we can get. Okay, okay, next question. Please come to the microphone, state your name. My name is Adam Bowen. I live on North Street. I invite each candidate to speak to their abilities and track record in terms of being a unifying force in the city of Northampton. Thanks. I'm sorry, Ben Jay. Um, thank you for that question. Um, the question is whether or not, or what have we done personally to be a unifying force in the, in the, the community? Um, I'll speak from my experience most recently in uh, the work that I've done as I sit on the Board of Public Works. I have worked as the co-chair of the Solid Waste Action Committee. And one of the things that we really worked at was first, um, trying to generate better understanding about what is recyclable and what is not in Northampton. And then to move on beyond that and to develop a plan and implement that plan to what can we do with the things that we think should be recyclable but aren't at the moment. And I think the end result of that was a group working together with uh, the support of Karen Berkulian from the DPW staff to really look at those things that end up sort of marginally in the waste stream that shouldn't be in the waste stream and trying to find a way to reuse them. And we had that very successful reuse um, <coughs> fair the, a couple of weeks ago on, at uh, the Smith Vocational High School where we took rigid plastics as sort of the core of what we were trying to recycle. Really moved beyond that and said people brought things in. The things that we were sort of sensing <coughs> were functional and could be reused, we pulled out of the waste stream set out on the lawn, people came along, shops, took some of it home with them, but we really worked together as a team to really divert a whole bunch of stuff that would have ended up in a landfill, out of the landfill, and instead used very functionally in somebody else's own backyard. Your camera okay? Oh, it's great. It just, it just bounced on the floor, so. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, when I When I served as a city council, um, one of the things that there was a lot of local divisions around issues relative to 
youth. And uh, part of my concern was that we had a lot of us deciding what would be best for the youth without actually soliciting the youth's opinions and thoughts. So established, I worked with the mayor's office and established a youth council, a youth council that would actually deliberate um, city issues that were relevant and germane to them. And that they, they would actually vote and make recommendations as well, or in, in the same way that any subcommittee of the city works. Then actually negotiating with uh, residents of Hampshire Heights, Hampton Gardens, trying to maintain affordability in these regions and also maintain quality lives and quality circumstances. And then when I went into radio, it was to invite all sides of the issues, on, and not just two sides, there's rarely two sides on the issue, but to have the all sides represented and speaking to issues that were germane and relevant to the people, and it meant a lot to the people here in the community. It's, it's what I do well, and it's what I'm most proud of. And I think that, you know, uh, I don't buck hay very well. I drive okay, but for the most part, the thing that I'm most proud of is the way I conduct myself now. Thank you. Um, I'm Ian Eider. Uh, my education in the field of counseling is a good listener. I've already met with the farmers down in Ward 3. We already know that's a hot contested area. I'm looking to work with some of the people that have, uh, live around the, uh, the uh, Three County Fair. I've met with the residents of uh, Cahill uh, with uh, Salvo House. I've met, uh, walked the wards of the uh, city. I've, I've been a good listener. So I'm already working on the issues. I've worked uh, on a couple of issues with David Narkowitz already to get a, a light turned down at, on at the Cahill that was been out for the last six months. So I'm a uniter. I, I'm willing to work with anybody. Um, whoever the mayor shall be, I will be there uh, backing them when he needs to be backed, but not afraid to ask a question uh, and find out a different answer if it need be. So uh, if you look at the breadth of my uh, experience, it's been service oriented. Uh, I worked at Big Y and I had people under me. I had to be a uniter um, in this position. So if you look at my field experience, you'll see that I'm a uniter. Thank you. We have 14 precincts in this city, but we are one city. I believe in unity. Two years ago when I was running, I emphasized unity repeatedly, and I still do. In this first term, I have encouraged spirited and respectful debates. I'm in this job, and I know how to do this job. And one of the things I've learned in my first term is how to be a unifier. People, I'm, a, I'm an accessible guy. I make my way throughout the city all the time. I live and work downtown. When I step outside of my house, I have people criticizing me, and that's fine. People say, you can do this, you can do that, and I say, look, I, I, and the point is, I engage people with different points of view all the time. I have no choice, but if I would, I still wouldn't hide from them. I'm a unifier, I have been, I've represented this entire city, I love the whole city, and if you give me the opportunity, I'll continue to do just that. Now, I, I just want to echo and appreciate the work that um, Bill did with the Youth Commission. And my oldest daughter sat on the Youth Commission, and it was one of the most valuable experiences <laughs> that I've had as a teenager. So thank you for that. Thank you. No, I can only ruin it if I did. <laughs> <laughs> It's a must for, for uh, everything that's in the city. It's a must. Hi, my name is Bill Sher. Um, a lot of talk nationally about how we create jobs. Um, in Northampton, recently we have invested in a, a new police station. Uh, we invested in bike paths, invested in roundabout. Uh, are these good examples of how we in Northampton can do something about the national economy and create jobs at home? I'm sorry. Um, yes. Yes, and actually, there, at times when we have these discussions, there's a disconnect about the, the value of infrastructure versus the value of anything else. Infrastructure is not quite as alluring until it stops functioning. When the potholes, when the streets collapse, when the roundabout, when the, there's traffic congestion, or, or people are uh, people's lives are affected by the, the, the this disintegration of what we call our infrastructure. 
it's we basically have benefited enormously from the investment by people who perceive us. We will pass on the burden to people who come after us if we defer maintenance and investment in systems that benefit the city in every way and every manifestation. It, is, it would not make sense for us to, at, regardless of the challenges, to pass up an opportunity to maintain our superstructure and our infrastructure. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be sitting here and we'd be uh, uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, yelling about us, we, who didn't, didn't carry our share. I'd, I'd just like to echo what he said, but I, I think the important aspect from the federal government is funds. Uh, it, it's getting the funds here. It's uh, uh, lobbying our congressmen, um, trillions of dollars in debt. I'm not sure that, that much more money can come this way. Um, we've done a lot with the, uh, the federal money that we had, the roundabout, as, as uh, Mr. Shearer pointed out. Um, we need to do better. Uh, we need to lobby a lot stronger. Uh, and I believe if, uh, as citizens, if we get out there with our council and do letter writing that, and really uh, put them where the votes count, that they will hear our voices. Um, that's, this is the way we're going to get more dollars invested in the community. We already have a transport, transport model to come this way. We need more funding to come this way. I heard two things in, in Mr. Shear's question. I'd like to respond to both. The first thing I'd like to respond to is bike paths and roundabouts. Both are important. I believe in, in Northampton that is livable, walkable, and bikeable. This first term, I was vice chair of parking and transportation, and that's related to the transportation side. And I was chair of the Board of Public Works and City Council Conference Committee, and that's related to the infrastructure side. And I do believe that safe and useful infrastructure will lead to a better Northampton, and that safe and useful infrastructure will also help job growth in Northampton. With respect to jobs, we need more jobs in Northampton. We can do better. And I see certain specific areas where we can do better. One is on King Street. There are set of zoning revisions for aimed at King Street. And the hope is that with those revisions, excuse me, revisions, we'll be able to attract more businesses in, more businesses that are consistent with Northampton, the character of Northampton, and with that, more jobs. Another place is the fairgrounds. As that development grows over the coming years, that'll be a place for economic growth and will hopefully bring jobs to the city. Another one is uh, the Round Hill uh, uh, part of Northampton right behind Pulaski Park. As that grows, there will be more jobs there too. But again, in my experience, I think that we do need more jobs. If you're elected, I will continue to work towards that goal. Thank you. I think that's a very important question about what can we do to create jobs here in the Northampton area. Uh, we know that we are at a, in an economy that is pretty lame has limped along in terms of job creation, although it's, it's good to know that North Massachusetts has done better than the country as a whole. And the reality is, is that at the federal level, as they look to invest, hopefully, more money into infrastructure, I think that that will be money well spent because I think not just here in Northampton, but across the country, we've seen a real disinvestment in those things that have made us great, and that is our roads, our, our, um, our bridges, the safety of our infrastructure. And that money spent in local infrastructure, on streets, on roads, on drainage, on bridges, is money well spent because it has a very strong multiplier effect in the local economy. Construction does a great deal to spin off other economic activity in the, in the, uh, the local regional economy. It's probably the best dollars we could spend in trying to come out of this recession is really to take care of that deferred maintenance that has happened in our infrastructure. And I can tell you that sitting as a member of the Board of Public Works, every every week when we have a meeting, we hear about failed drainage, failed uh, streets, um, sidewalks that seem unsafe to the folks whose houses they run in front of. And we know that we have not been able to invest in them locally. I'll tell you that one of the things I think that Northampton has been very effective in is is that when the money becomes available, is we have been ready to take it because we have done the planning to have things shovel ready. The Jackson Street School um, project, the road work that happened in the front there, happened because we were shovel ready. And I think that good planning leads to the ability to take advantage of those local or those state resources and federal resources that become available. Uh, and it, I'm sorry, just a quick follow-up relative to jobs. I mean, one of the, the principal assets that Northampton has is actually Northampton. 
it's, we are an appealing place to live, an enormously appealing place to live, and that, if we maintain that, our best faiths and our best systems, then we therefore appeal to job creators. No one's coming here to build a big factory, that's not likely. And, but what we, there are a lot of people in, in uh, fields of, of, uh, of uh, computer development and, and software development and other things that require telecommuters. If you provide a good place for their company to be and a good place for their, their employees to live, an appealing place, then you've sold them. Um, in, in kind of coming off of uh, Bill's comment, um, are we business friendly? Uh, are we? I mean, we've, we've taken over 10 years to redo King Street. And, and uh, is that something that we, we could have done earlier? Uh, I can't blame it all on the bad economy because it, it was more than 10 years ago that the, the Hillendale was closed. And uh, we, were sh we were slow in, in reacting uh, as far as uh, being open to uh, attracting businesses. King Street is a prime example. I will work hard to make sure that if something's not right, to take a second look at it and adjust it to where it should be. And that's how we're going to create jobs, is making it is business friendly. And, and looking after the dollar for dollars from the federal government. Thank you. Okay, next question. Hi, Steve Lucas from Turkeyville Road here in Florence. My question regards the upcoming ballot question we'll have on the CPA. And my direct, direct question is how will you vote and why? And I'd like to remind you that a no vote will keep the CPA in place. The yes vote will reject the CPA. Thank you. Um, I put in motion, I talked to Mr. Mark Carmen, who's a, a Ward 6 uh, resident. I uh, had a conversation with him about the CPA and some information, misinformation out there. Within a week, he had a meeting at the city council to clarify what the CPA does, what's good about the CPA. Uh, so I put that in, in, in motion. Um, I believe it's done some real good projects, uh, being Allard Farm is one of them, but the electronic reader board, from what I'm hearing from residents, was one that had no historic uh, value at all. Um, and, and talking to, uh, with the wards, and uh, the CPA is part of the Citizens Democratic process, they have talked about in my campaign, citizen input. Um, as a council at large, I'm promoting the process of allowing views to be heard. Um, what I find interesting is that uh, there's been no conversation involving possibly reducing this to 3% to maybe 2%, 1.5%, allowing both sides to compromise. And I'm wondering why not. It's either up or down. Uh, I'm, so I'm wondering why we're not having this conversation to keep the CPA at a lower level to make everybody happy. Um, we should be looking for a compromise. So both sides that are against it and ones that are for it will have some input as is how um, we want it. To move along. If the CPA uh, passes, I will work hard to make sure that the proper things are done as your counselor at large to make sure that it's based on the needs of the city and, and it's good for all residents. Thank you. The CPA is an average $79 on each person's tax bill, average. And that money has gone, gone to some very, very important things that I think we all care about. Some of those things are the restoration of Forbes Library. Lily Library projects, the Florence Fields, the David Rubble Center, First Churches, the Academy of Music. I think it is an important conversation that we should have as to whether or not our expenditures are consistent with our values and priorities. <laughs> However, I support the CPA. For us to sit here and say that it's for the voters to decide, well, certainly it is, and each person can weigh in on that. But that's also saying, that it's okay for the CPA to fail, and that I don't care. I do care. I want the CPA to succeed and continue to be successful in Northampton. It has done some wonderful things. So I'll answer the question. I want to keep the CPA in Northampton, and I hope that you all do too. I want to tell you that I unequivocally support the continuance of the CPA, and I'll share with you that uh, I say that because I'm the executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, and quite honestly, and in fairness of full disclosure, uh, without the CPA funds, uh, it would be very difficult to create home ownership opportunities for working class people in Northampton without the CPA money available to us. I'll also share with you that as 
the treasurer for First Churches, the primary downtown focal point uh, church that without the, uh, the resources that came to the First Churches from the uh, Community Preservation Act, we would still be struggling along trying to re you know, re restore a building that is an absolute critical uh, piece of the downtown uh, character. And for those critical reasons, and the fact that Northampton, I mean, when people think of Northampton, they think of our downtown area. And that is an incredibly important tourist and local uh, resource that we have. And we need to invest in it to keep the resource there and to keep it manageable and safe, quite honestly. The CPA money is incredibly important. It's done wonderful resource, it's done wonderful things with the beans bean allard farm. I look around and I think, what better articulation of our community values than to preserve and retain those working farms and to add in some new uses that are desperately needed by the community. The recreational fields that will come from that, they're more community farms, and it's a, a critically important resource that we need to retain. On the same side, I will say that it's critically important that we spend our money well, and when people say, dollars to do pothole repair or dollars to do CPA, I want to make sure that we're getting as much resources into the infrastructure as we can, given our local uh, revenue stream. Thank you. May I interrupt you for a moment, Bill? Excuse me. Go ahead. There are lots of chairs over here. People, oh, there are a lot of people standing in the back. Please help yourself to a chair. And... <laughs> there are somebody standing, so. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to tell people they could take those off. Hi, for those of you coming in, we're talking about the CPA. Yeah. <laughs> 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 The Community Preservation Act actually is a miracle act as far as these things go. The beauty of it is, despite, I mean, you know, we just talked about the virtues, about the fact that it's leveraged over $20 million of outside investment in the community. $20 million. There's nothing else we can do that would do that. But the fact is, is this is money that's collected here, stays here, it's matched in varying degrees from the state, and then we get to disperse and distribute it based on the four, four items of criteria historical preservation, affordable housing, uh, 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 recreational exp uh, expansion, and open space. <laughs> One, three things on walks. But the, the, and the thing is that it's done that so well, so successfully, and the fact is that any one of us who takes issue, if, if it's the electronic board at the Academy of Music, we can go speak to an appointed, we actually just met some of the candidates for the elected position, for uh, elected and appointed members of our community and make our case known. And then they send their recommendation to the city council and once again there's two bites of the apple to, to determine how these tax dollars are apportioned. There is no other tax system that we have in the city, no other revenue system and distribution system that has as much access, as much transparency, that does as much as it does for this community. Um. I agree with it, what everybody said. It's done tremendous good things, but in listening to the, the citizens again, it's citizens' input. They, they say it's about self preservation. Although $79 is a small amount, the upcoming taxes of, or fees of 18% of water and sewer every year, most likely a two and a half pro property tax increase, and a possible trash fee between three and $500, $79 for some people in this economic times is really tough. And that's what they're talking about. I've been out in every ward, and, and they, they've told me this. They like the CPA, but they think we need to take a break. I, I, I'm listening to the citizens. I like what's been done in some of the stuff, some I don't. Um, I, I support the CPA in theory. But when you listen to the citizens, again, it's a citizen's initiative, and that's what we're, I, I don't think that's being pushed upon. I still would like to talk about possibly moving to 2 or 1%. That way, everybody gets a compromise and wins. So I'd like to really talk about that. If, if I made to that point, I believe that the enabling legislation doesn't allow Jesse, that. Jesse, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to jump in. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say that, um, that my experience has been most of the CPA money does go into construction. And if you want job creation, that's where you spend your money is in construction and site development. And that's where my sense is, I know that's where we spent all the money with the first churches, is that that's really a very important thing. I do hear your concerns. I think the economy, when we passed the CPA money, the economy was feeling pretty good. And I do know that people are feeling strapped. 
So I, I certainly honor and appreciate and acknowledge what you've been hearing, Mike, that I think it's very real. And then we have to think that we have to make sure that those dollars are well spent. And that they're just not local. I mean, the local impact, I think, is incredibly important in the economy. Sorry, jump my turn. But actually, unfortunately, uh, for better or for worse, regardless of the proposal, I believe the enabling legislation doesn't allow you to reconfigure the the attitude of, of the CPA as it stands. It either gets voted up or down, gets repealed. So a compromise like that because of the enabling legislation is impossible to achieve. The other thing is that that there are protections for people at risk here. There's protections. The assessment doesn't occur until after the first $100,000 evaluation on any property. And then also, for people who are needy and for the elderly, you're exempt. You don't have to pay. There's as many protections built into this. That's another thing that makes this tax, such as it is, a revenue stream for us, a miracle tax. Thank you. Any next questions? Please take your name. My name is Jasper. I live 42 Butler Place, Ward 3. Uh, so my question is, I know it's was touched on very briefly, but uh, there are two enormous vacant lots on King Street, the old Honda dealership and the mall. And they've been empty for a very long time. Um, my question is two parts. First of all, what do you think the city can do to uh, do something with those lots? And two, if you could do whatever you wanted with them, what would that be? Oh, and uh, keep the CPA. <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> That's a good question, Jasper. The fact of the matter is, those two lots have been vacant for a very long time. And I, I believe we do need to, as I stated earlier, fill those two vacancies and hopefully they'll bring jobs when those vacancies are filled. I think, Jasper, that my hope is that if we rezone King Street to make it more business friendly, yet still as green as possible while making business spending. That's the best opportunity that we have to, to fill those two, two vacancies. And in, in my experience, that's you know, regret. They need to be filled, and as I stated earlier, we need to be better on jobs, and I'm hoping we can with those. What I'd like to see ideally, I, would, I, I think two big needs we have are, are, are mixed use buildings, Residential, excuse me, commercial on the first floor, and residential on the floors. I'm not sure if that'll happen in either of those lots, but you know, if we're going to be idealistic, I'd like to see that and possibly an intermodal facility for the rail system that's coming in. That's being ideal. Being practical, I would like to see some sort of business that fits with the character and nature of Northampton and brings jobs. Um, I've got to echo what I what I just heard Jesse say in terms of thinking about the future. Uh, we've talked about the um, rail extension coming up from uh, the Springfield area, the, the high-speed rail <coughs> extending from New Haven up to Springfield and hopefully up into Northampton eventually. So I think the city has to keep a very close eye and be very much engaged in that conversation with the regional uh, transportation people about what the possibilities are because that King Street corridor has great potential. The rail is there. Um, and we should be making sure that um, as that conversation advances, which I believe it will result in some sort of rail service, commuter rail service up into Northampton at some point in my lifetime, um, that we need to be prepared to be able to accommodate that in the King Street area. The other thing is, is that we have sat there and seen those vacant lots and they have been eyesores and reminders to us that um, sometimes what's happening and what comes to roost in Northampton is what's happening in the regional economy, uh, the national economy. We have overbuilt a commercial space and we are now facing less, less demand for that. And we do not want to build more of what is not needed. So I want to be mindful that we have you know, economic development professionals and who work for the city. We participate actively in the region's economic plan and we should be mindful of what the region needs. And that remind, remind yourself that Northampton I think holds a very unique position as a very attractive uh, community that will draw people to come work and want to live and work here who want livable, workable cities and jobs that they can attend. Uh, hello, Jasper. I, uh, I live a block from King Street. I'm quite intimate with King Street in that I was also involved in the two years of deliberation 
that created the zoning that's currently being modified. Um, and, and also very familiar with the issues. And, and the two empty lots, as everyone passes by and everyone looks up and goes, what, what is going on? And the thing is, is that what's going on is those lots are like individual personalities. They have their own individual challenges associated with them. They're not, it's the economy, the, uh, the price shopper lot, for instance, the, uh, the price shopper folks were paying rent on that property for a decade after they even closed the store. There was no impetus to flip the property because it was collecting money without any other investment. Uh, there were about four developers, I think, that came and went for a variety of reasons. Some of them they claimed were the zoning, some of them complained that they just couldn't get the systems that they wanted to go in there. The, the same thing, the Honda dealership lot, again, it's, it's as much as trying to negotiate with the ownership and the proper developer to come in. The city has a kind of limited role in this. We don't build those properties, we don't own them. We don't control them to the, only to the extent that we actually create zoning that projects what, what the community's vision would be. You ask what I would do? If I were king of the world, I would love to see down around the Cole Morgan site a whole other neighborhood, a, a community neighborhood of stores and shops owned by locals. Um, Eric Jasper, thank you very much. I've already touched on this, as you, you said. I, I think it has to do with um, timing. It, it's, we watched this property sit there for so long, and we didn't do anything about it. We didn't be we weren't more acceptable to businesses to come in and make uh, proposals. Those properties have sat for a long time. It's almost 15 years. And as, as Bill said, that um, it, it's an eyesore. And uh, the transportation model, it, it possibly come, could come here a lot quicker than it would be uh, excellent. As far as that creating a bunch of jobs, the city has a limited hand in it. Uh, and it, to get the, the businesses to come is where the jobs are going to come. So we really need, King Street, is, we have some proposals to do changes. Um, those need to move forward. And uh, we need to look at other parts of the city that could be marketable too. It's not just King Street. We really need to be more accepting to businesses all around. And that is where we're going to create the jobs. And the city has a, a partial hand in it. And it's, it's doing uh, ordinances and, and looking at what we can do to make business more acceptable to come in. Thank you. Um, just like to expand on that just a bit, the, the, the part of the problems right now is we have, we do have a blighted site that the city does, as I said, have a limited ability to make appeal. There has actually have been part of negotiations, a lot of negotiations for the disposition of that property. And the city actually has worked very hard to try and get something to work there. It's, it's not from lack of outreach, it's from lack of investment. And that is, you're sitting, what you're looking at on King Street is the most expensive real estate in this part of the state. It's very expensive. The reason is because it's such a prime location. It's such an appealing place for large-scale retail systems. And as such, we run into another problem now. We have a depressed economy with uh, discretionary dollars not being spent. Developers are not coming in building those stores now and they're not making pitches so um, can we have more citizen input and look at what we can do that's different maybe we need to pare down and look at small type businesses little micro businesses that will come into the city our, our, our um, is our picture too big should we change it um, we're gonna have to work with a mayor the mayor is going to be the one that's the driver in this uh, so the counselors will have to work with, with whoever that mayor is and let's try and really uh, tweak and see what we can do that's different. We need to do things differently, not the same old thing. Thank you. Next question. Somebody, someone like to come to the mic and ask a question? Can you stand to the mic and state your name? <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Riley. I live on Prospect Street. And I have a question about a future infrastructure project, which is, when the landfill closes, I understand that there's a proposal to put a solar energy facility um, on the site. And I think that's a great idea. 
My concern about the idea, as it's been talked about so far, is that it requires a private investor to put up the capital and ultimately profit and sell the energy back to us. And my understanding of reading about municipalization of energy facilities in the state of Massachusetts, municipalities that own their own energy infrastructure can offer energy at rates that are somewhere between 15 to 30 percent lower than private rates. And so I'm wondering, I know that you know these economic times are hard, but is there a way to have this be a publicly funded project? I would you support that. Let's start with Jen. Um, landfill and photovoltaics, my two favorite topics. Um, first of all, the reality is the regional landfill is going to close probably next year towards the tail end of the year. And the question is, what's the best, highest and best use for the community for that site? And I think photovoltaic arrays, solar arrays are a great opportunity. We know that the city or the town of Amherst has been working through that process. And, um, and from someone who actually built houses that have photovoltaic arrays on them, I can tell you it's a wonderful way to co-generate electricity uh, at a very reasonable price. So I think it's a wonderful, sort of innovative thing that we can think about doing in the future. The question is, what's the role of cities in having that happen? And I'll, I'll share with you that I, I would say two things. First of all, um, I think that we've been a good manager of the landfill, but we don't know much about managing energy facilities. We have a waste to, what is it, uh, uh, the, the waste to energy plant that we have over there that we manage, it burns off the methane. And, and that's been challenging from time to time. I don't think that we're necessarily the best organization or the best entity to be doing that. But I will share with you that I think that the, uh, the Council of Governments is really uh, probably pretty innovative in terms of energy use. And I would certainly hope that we might tap our Council of Governments here in Hampshire County because they do have some pretty specific um, knowledge about energy and have, gen have worked on creating those energy opportunities. So that's the first door I would knock on. Uh, if we were to look forward. And I do think we need to be forward looking about what are the new uses for this site. Thank you, Donna. I, I think actually, the well, you know, as you've, you've seen in Amherst and you've seen these things, and these, are, the, these are being considered all over. It's a great reuse of the land, and, and, and of course the offsets would, be, would benefit us enormously. The issue about the municipal systems becoming a municipal energy system, there's actually a very good example of that just down the road in Hoyoke, which uh, generates its own water power. And there's the Hoyoke Water Power Commission. Now, I'm from Hoyoke, so is Mike. And we're, um, that comes with problems too, because then at that point it becomes a political end. And I don't, and, and it becomes, a, it'll be, certainly be a political issue as we sit and try to negotiate uh, an investment in that type of system here in the city. Um, clearly people would have concerns about how much it would cost, what would be the benefit. I mean, I think the benefit's pretty obvious. If, we, if it's a city-run municipal power system, then it's ours exclusively. I remember the blackout in the 70s. I was very disappointed because Holyoke stayed bright and light. And, and we, <laughs> that, was it that long ago? 1965? And, but the fact is that they, and, and they, all, but they also built the coal power plant, which as we know is one of the dirtiest in the country and has, it does, it's not serving us well nearby. We have to breathe the same air but don't enjoy the benefits of the power. But I, th I actually like the idea. And I think that actually speaks to something that uh, I think we need to do in this city, is look at exciting, visionary things like that. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, solar energy, it, it's, it's, it's going to be the future. I'm, I'm all on board for it. Um, I'm actually looking at uh, some for some uh, arrays to be put on my house. So the neighbor had some put on. I talked to a, a gentleman from Washington State. Uh, Smith College has done a study for us. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure where that is sitting right now. See if it's uh, feasible for us. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, that the city can do get on board with that. Um, it's all going to boil down to cost. It's, that's the big, big thing. Everything's going to be cost from from here on in. Um, with the federal government, we've seen that um, they backed the uh, company with solar arrays, and that went bankrupt. So I'm not I'm not too uh, sure where the money would come from it, but I, I would be on board on, and. Um, check and things out and see where, where we could uh, try and make an investment. I voted to close the landfill. I agonized over that decision. 
And that was easily the toughest decision I made in my first term. To look people and tell, tell them that you're going to close off a revenue stream in the toughest economy since the Great Depression, that's not easy to do. But I did it because I was willing to make the tough decisions. And the reason why is because I value public health. And I value the environment. And we need to recycle, reuse, and compost more and create disincentives. Not incentives to create waste, disincentives. And the landfill created incentives. And with respect to your question specifically, my vision for the future of Northampton, part of it is to have a solar facility at the landfill. And what we can do is we can look to our neighbors who are already doing it, who have already done it, like Greenfield, and learn from what they're going through, and learn from their mistakes and the things they've done right. And I will support that solar facility there and everything that, that for the, the best maximum public use there, if we can if we can make money for the city and offset our cost of energy through a solar facility over there, then that's what I'll support. Sure. I'd like to just speak to the, the necessity for the investment because I think that that's what gets lost in this conversation. I think everyone likes the end result, the fact that we might end up with photovoltaic arrays that generate electricity, but there is a financial investment that needs to be made. The question is, how does the city make a decision about whether or not that's a wise thing for us to be engaging in as, a, as, a, as an entity. It's not in our, uh, our mandate as a city to provide uh, energy for the, the residents or the community. Um, so how can we partner with other entities out there that might already have better understanding of the markets, better ability to take advantage of the uh, financial incentives that might be out there for the private sector that are simply not available to the municipal sector? And that's why I think that we should be mindful as we wade into that discussion about partnering with other entities that might have a better understanding of the market, a better understanding of the risks, and the better ability to manage that type of process and investment. I, I just add to that as the, as the states and the federal government are abrogating their responsibility, there's less and less revenue coming from that side and placing a greater, harsher burden on municipalities, which have, which is very, we're very limited in how we can generate money, and that's, that's through through uh, property taxes, we all know, which is capped at two and a half percent, fines and fees, and the fees have to go directly to the cost borne by whatever it is that's being done that the fee pays for, and fines. Uh, there's not enough bad parkers in Northampton to subsidize most of the projects that we would like to do. But with that challenge, I mean, I think clearly as the public has a conversation, because there is an offset when you you're generating your own energy, you're not buying the energy. So there, there is a benefit, and if we could do it well, and if the community has buy-in, I see that as to our advantage only. Um, I echo what he says, but I, I mean, I'm really happy that we live in a community that really cares about its environment and wants to do things differently. Um, cost, it's, it's all going to boil down to cost. Next question. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. sure. um, a resident from Florence. Um, at times I felt like my only shot at being heard by city government uh, is to go to the public comment session at the city council to voice my comments and concerns, mostly regarding a buffer behind my home and the lack of enforcement within the building office and the planning offices. <coughs> Um, and I'd like to say I'm glad to report I finally have a buffer behind my home today, just recently. Um, I have two parts of this question. The first question, the first part is, how will you unite people like me um, who feel this way about the city government and not being heard? And the second part of that question is, how and what would you do to ensure that the city uh, departments follow through on their decision making? Who's that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Actually, Red, I remember when we first came. Um, eight years ago. It was eight years ago. I was counseling. <clears throat> I think the frustration that you're speaking of is that it's born of a number of reasons, uh, and, and clearly ones that need to be corrected in large part. But they're also, what you're talking about is <laughs> access, or, or some people use the term transparency. Or in this case, you're not asking for transparency. You wanted you, you wanted actual results, and you wanted you wanted the you had a problem that you presented to the council that you wanted to rectify. Now, to be honest, I don't know what the circumstances were 
beyond your original appeal because I left the council right after that. Um, actually, to that extent, the, the sidewalks on Jackson Street that MJ referred to, I asked for 12 years ago. They did show up this year. So, I, yeah. so, I mean, I think you're talking about a couple of things. One is the slow reaction of the city, which could be, which could be an aspect of, of, you know, process. But the most important thing, the critical thing, and that I've heard discussed over and over again, is access to government or, or involvement in government. And unfortunately, the way it's set up right now, for the most part, we aren't aware of these things because they're in sub a lot of these things are deliberated in subcommittee meetings that, unfortunately, right now aren't televised, or people don't have access to them, and there's not enough reporters to cover them. I'm on the board of NCTV, and our ambition is to have every single subcommittee broadcast or online, and I have to stop now. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, we have something in place already. It's called best practices that, that uh, we should be really promoting. Um, our counselors should be highly accessible. They, uh, I go for having a uh, office hour to uh, make sure that you're, I'm accessible to you. I've gone throughout the city. I've, I've met with the seniors, the Cahill Apartments, uh, Ward 3. I've been at the uh, Neighborhood Watch meeting. I'm making myself accessible. And that's what this position is for, to make yourself accessible for all citizens throughout the, the uh, city. You should have three counselors working on your issues. Not one, not one more counselor, but three. And those two other counselors besides the ward should be accessible to you in working on your, your problems. We should be pushing the best practices, and I will make sure that all departments are uh, accessible to the public. We should have more public meetings. The uh, trash bag thing it was horrendous. We should have had a, uh, a public hearing on it. That is one, one thing that I will push for, is make sure that our government is accessible. Um, we talked about the, the, the TV. That's one aspect. But having the meetings in the JFK or the uh, high school at least twice a year, a council meeting, or uh, if it's a high issue thing, we have those meetings so they're accessible to the, the residents. Thank you. Very high value accessibility. My first term in that policy where anyone who emails me, calls me, Facebooks me, texts me, text me, however they get, if they're trying to get a hold of me specifically, my policy is to get back to them. Even if it means an hour conversation where I get yelled at the whole time, that happens sometimes. But also, the, the, the point is that I get back, you know, unless they're making a general comment and how they feel about a specific subject night, and I weigh that in my decision making. But not only have I feel that I've been accessible, but I, as I stated before, that I was the vice chair of the of the uh, Charter Review Committee, which is part of Best Practices Number 10. I fought for Best Practices in my first term. And frankly, it took a long time to get your budget. I'm glad it got done. And we can do better. I'm sorry it took so long. The government is slow moving. And with respect to your answer about how we make sure that departments follow up, it's by being persistent. I can't tell you how many times I've called the DPW director in my first term asking for him to get certain things done. And and he, and he listens. And, but the thing is, there's a lot to do with limited resources, with limited means. So that's how we get them to follow up, and we can do better, and I'll try to do better for you. I'm going to share with you that my sense is, is that the, the, the public comment uh, piece in the City Council uh, meeting is more of frustration with people who have tried to reach out, be in touch with their city councilors, be in touch with the city staff, and have are so frustrated that they end up at that meeting because they feel like they have no place else to go. I'll promise you that as your city councilor at large that I will make sure that you will not end up there if you've made a call to me. That I will work with you, help you identify the people in the community and the municipal staff that you need to be working with and help give you answers. It's not always going to be the answers that you're going to want to hear, but by the time you do get to the city council, you will be there because there is no actual response to your issue at hand. But I do want you to end up there only if I, as your city councilor, have worked with you to help you connect with the local, like I said, the municipal staff or the other people who need to be involved and help to identify what the problem is, who are the people who need to come around the table, serve as problem solvers, stakeholders, who have some investment in seeing that issue resolved, and work as positively as they can to resolve it. So 
that's that's what I can promise. And I, I do need to echo what Mike said, that you have three city councilors working for each of you. That your, your ward councilor and the two at large are there for you, and that you should use them. I uh, just a point of information, all meetings are public meetings. They have to be if they involve city officials, particularly if there's a quorum of city officials. <laughs> um, the problem is, in what I think the frustration that everyone's talking about is, when do I, what, I don't go to every meeting to try and figure out what's going to apply to me, so when do I find out things apply to me? And I think that's, that's the point that we have to massage, we have to figure out, and I don't have the answer, I don't think anyone at this table has the answer right now, but the fact is, is we have to clearly work out engagement from the community so that, I mean, because I don't think anyone's particularly avoid, any councilor's avoided anybody or avoided any issue or deliberately dragged on something. The fact is, is that there's, there's a disconnect and, a dis, and it's a communication disconnect. And uh, we bear the responsibility because we're asking for the responsibility. We bear the responsibility of trying to bridge that and make it as accessible as possible. Short of coming to your house every day and telling you what's going on and having you get a restraining order against us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, I just have to give an example. Um, I'm not on the council, and the Cahill Apartments needed a light put on. I worked with David Narkowitz to get a light that had been off six months, and it was a safety issue. They, they said they contacted all their councilors that they could, and they came to me as a candidate. I worked hard, I worked with David and Mr. John Height, and got that light on in one week. So there is a disconnect, and you as citizens need to really look at uh, if you're uh, okay with that. If you're not, then you need to change things. Jesse. That constituent never came to me. If they did, that light would have gone on quicker. <laughs> Safe and useful infrastructure will lead to a better Northampton. 
And throughout my first term, I've applied budget scrutiny. I've examined our budgets to make sure that our spending matches our values and priorities. And we as counselors vote on each and every capital expenditure. We need to do more. I was proud that we got the police station done last year despite the tough times. And there's still many, many, many millions of, millions of dollars worth of capital improvements needs. The best thing we can do, Jim, is continue to scrutinize these budgets. I know you do it and all the counselors do it. And continue to listen to our constituents to make sure that our spending matches our values and priorities. I've done that in my first term. If we elected, I'll continue to do that. Um, we have a capital uh, planning process that I know is working towards trying to get 5% of our budget into uh, capital investments for the community. And I think that's a critically important process that we not only take a look at what our current needs are, but also what are our needs for the future. You know, you and I are driving on streets that our fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers paid for, and we have not invested in, in keeping them up. And because of that, Repeatedly at the Board of Public Works, we hear concerns about the safety of the infrastructure, the road, the bridges, the sidewalks, the drainage systems, the flood control systems here in the city of Northampton. We are not investing adequately in them. The good news is that we have a capital improvement plan that's actually put together by a number of the leaders in the, in the community, department heads, uh, city councilors, who sit and make decisions about the requests that are put in front of them about what are our priorities, and they hash through what are the, the things that should be at the top of the list. I'm pleased to report that in the, the next couple of years, we actually have half a million dollars worth of uh, money that's in the budget to help start repairing the roads that have actually been, in my mind, abandoned in terms of maintenance simply because of budget issues that over the last couple of years. These are critically important resources. They are our asset. They are our bank. They are what we live on every day. And we need to make sure that we're taking good care of them maintaining them rather than having to invest in rebuilding them when they become so destroyed, so worn out that they are beyond salvage. Uh, capital improvement is a misnomer. It's not much of an improvement when you have to replace a plow blade that's repaired. And that's the that's we almost I mean that's the level we're, we're functioning at. I mean we're functioning at trying we're we're not improving much, we're just trying to restore or maintain what we have in a, in a working fashion. So you're absolutely right, investment in that is critical. There's not an argument here at this table that I've been able to pick up. The fact is, as Mike said, well, how do you subsidize it? And I think that's what, that was the gist of your question. I mean, where do you get the money from? And the money, basically, since we can't generate any more money because we're capped at 2.5% on taxes, and as I said, the revenues and fees and fines, those are limited as well. So we make tough decisions. And what we're asking, uh, what, what you would be asking of us, any one of us who is fortunate enough to serve you, is that you're going to have to trust in us, hopefully, that we have the ability to make the tougher decisions that we're going to be facing. They will be tough decisions. There is not a lot of money coming there. Uh, if there is, and I leverage that, then I'll run for king of the world. But if he, until such time, I will, I will serve as a counselor, try and figure out what our priorities are, negotiating with other counselors as we try to build consensus and figure out what's the best way and what to allocate and prioritize money and vote it to the best interest of the city. I, I, I just have to agree with Bill, the big word is prioritize. We need to prioritize. We really need to look at how we're prioritizing, how the money's coming in, how the money's going out. I totally agree with Bill on prioritizing. I think that's what's missing at this point in time. I think it has to be stronger to prioritize. Jesse. I'm good. Okay. Now we will move toward your final comments. We have two minutes, and we'll start with Jesse. I want to thank all the sponsors, and I want to thank all of you for taking part in your democracy. I believe in my first term that I've served you well as your at-large city councilor. I love this job, and I would like to continue serving. There are important issues that I would like to address in my next term. Drafting and adopting a new charter that will facilitate a more transparent, balanced, and effective government. Addressing our ailing infrastructure, including our roads, public buildings, and sewers, because safe and useful infrastructure will lead to an even better Northampton. 
continued advocacy for more school funding to maintain quality public education. These are some of the things I'd like to do if you re-elect me. And I have a proven track record of delivering my promises. Public service is important, and it's a lot of work. And I'd like to thank Bill, MJ, and Mike for this spirited discussion. There are great candidates in this race. I want you to think about who of these new at-large candidates, candidates will best work with me. Because who paired with a new at-large counselor better than one with experience? It's been an honor to serve, and I'd love to be re-elected. And I thank you for your vote. Um, I'm really looking forward to this election. I do agree that you've got some four good choices to make and that the, how we distinguish ourselves from each other will be an interesting uh, vote that we will witness on November 8th. Um, I want to share with you that what I think I bring is really a, a, a very broad and sophisticated background, first to having grown up here, understanding the background and the history of Northampton and knowing it at a time when it was not at its best watching it grow, flourish, become this robust, wonderful, livable community that I was happy to bring my family back to to raise them here. I think that what I bring to you is a regional perspective, having worked as the region's economic development planner a number of years ago, and now as the uh, executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat, really working every day, making the values of the community come alive as we take the real values of the community, what's important to us, and make it very real in the community. I bring experience having been, served on the Board of Public Works for the last couple of years. I actually have had a very substantial background in the solid waste management issue, having spent um, my one day in eighth grade opening up the recycling center at Locust Street, pounding glass in a 55-gallon barrel, uh, all the way to my recent vote in support of the regional landfill, which I know is probably controversial uh, in this room. But it was, a, it was a decision that was uh, based on um, long, thoughtful research and discussion with my peers on the Board of Public Works. And I look to step into the City Council and to continue to have those long, thoughtful conversations um, that moves us to action. Uh, it's not enough just to discuss and deli to deliberate. We really need to move into thoughtful, progressive, forward-thinking, collaborative action. And that's what I hope to bring to you on November 8th when you elect me as your city councilor at large. We uh, all watch with frustration and anger at the inability of the federal government to function. Uh, politics has supplanted governance. And our national government is paralyzed at a time when we really need it the most. It's failing us, and then we bear the consequences. Now, the global financial situation will improve or not. Uh, we'll see. It really doesn't have much to do with us right now. The fact is that the city of Northampton has to cope with the challenges that are presented, and we've got to cope with them now. We can't defer them, and we have to do it with integrity and hope. And we cannot afford to allow the process to be infected with the malaise that we're seeing nationally. I served as eight years as the counselor representing the citizens of Ward 1, and there were many contentious issues that were negotiated then. And I found that as we called out the politics and the passions, and we focused on a great set of facts, we crafted good law and we made good decisions. I worry at this critical time that we're not immune from the practice of political games infecting brave governments. And I worry that we run the risk of exploiting divisions instead of promoting hopeful visions. And I worry that Northampton will lose and forget the power of unity and, and mutual effort and succumb to fighting territorial battles that, that pit union against union parent against parent, and neighbor against neighbor. And we can all agree on one thing. We cherish this place. We love this town, warts and all. And that, you know what? That's a very, very fortunate place to start when we start our conversations. The preservation and enhancement of our community must be our main objective. And we're going to disagree as how best to achieve that and what success looks like. But we know that our, all of our goals is to do the very best for our city. I have the skills and the desire to serve with conviction and respect. I want to serve the city again, always aware of the singular objective of keeping the city we share a rare and special place. I have the honor to have your vote on November 8th. Again, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to be part of the democratic process. This election is about commitment and experience. 
I believe I have proven that I have the commitment, experience, and education to be an effective counselor at large, who will equally represent all citizens of Northampton. I have shown in the past few months that I am not afraid to think and speak independently, and to challenge people to think outside the box to solve the city's problems. The former mayor has said, budget is the lifeblood of the city. Knowing this, I have attended every budget meeting so that I will be able to make informed decisions on our city budgets. I have walked every ward in this city and talked to many residents who believe their input on crucial decisions are being ignored. Only one, one, has, one has only to read the newspapers to watch council meetings to know what, that the police officers, firefighters, and teachers and the residents are unhappy and feel ignored. To be more informed on the important issues, I have attended many city meetings, including the Joint School Committee City Council meeting and the Yes Northampton Informational meeting in May. I have not been silent on the need for teachers for the first grade level in all elementary schools or the contracted step raises for teachers. I would like to leave here, leave, I would like you to leave here tonight with one question. What do you want for representation from your council at large? I believe that by electing me on November 8th, you will answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the first question.